Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I want to welcome you to The Vine, our online campus, in which uh, we're able to uh, share our weekly worship services with you through uh, the medium of video. And so uh, we just really appreciate the fact that you've taken time to watch this today. It's the second Sunday of Advent. We're getting ever so closer to the um, arrival of Jesus uh, coming into the world. And uh, our preparation time is getting uh, a, a little bit more um, busy and, um, and perhaps uh, a little more um, intentional in our expectations. And so I, I pray that this is an intentional time of worship for you. Um, we're, again, I'm just so glad that you've taken time to uh, spend with us today, and I pray that God will touch you in a special way throughout this week. Thanks for being with us. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to get to lead us in our opening prayer this morning. Please join me now. The words will be found on your screen. Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do and seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day, we who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people, walking in darkness yet seeking the light. To you we say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Peace, a reading from Isaiah 9, 6, 7. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and joy. O oh come, O oh come, Emmanuel.
Please join me as we pray together. God of the ages, we praise you. For in the dawn of time you created the world, sending light by your word to dispel the darkness. In Jesus Christ you began a new creation, sending him to be the light of the world, to drive away fear and despair, to rule in peace and justice in holiness and love. We especially thank you this day for the order and beauty of your creation, for coming in Jesus Christ to share in our human life, for the promise of peace among nations, for justice for all peoples, and for the church as a sign of your coming kingdom. Almighty God, prepare the world for your rule, for we long for the day when there shall be no more crying or tears and death will be destroyed. Help us to share the ministry of Christ and to be agents of his compassion. We especially ask that you lean down with your healing touch and bless those that we lift before you on our lips or in our hearts. Gracious God who brings light into darkness, we pray this day for Israel, for Gaza, for Ukraine, for peace in this world. We pray for victims and survivors of violence and mass shootings, for those who are sick and suffering, for our families and friends, including those who grieve and those relationships that are estranged. And we pray for the church in all the ways that your spirit is working in our lives as we pray the prayer your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we've come to a really unique part of the worship service where we give people an opportunity to give back a portion of what God has given to them. You can make a check out to Wrightsville United Methodist Church and put it in the mail to Post Office Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. Or you can go online to our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, and hit the Giving tab. Or you can give through the, the Wrightsville UMC app. We especially appreciate your gifts uh, this time of year, and thank you for um, thinking of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. kids, I'm Pastor Julia, and today we are talking about a very, very special story here at church. Today we are telling the story of a girl named Mary. You probably know Mary as Jesus's mom, but before she was Jesus's mom, she was just a regular girl. And she lived in a town called Nazareth in Israel. I have a picture today of an artist who made a painting of what he thinks that maybe Mary looked like. And I think it's a really special picture and I wanted to show it to you today. This is Mary. And you can see in this picture that something kind of weird is happening to her. This picture tells the same story that we're reading in church today, which is that one day Mary was just minding her own business when suddenly an angel came, an angel 
is someone who comes from God to tell someone on earth a message. They're messengers from God. And in this painting, the angel is just like a big, big, bright spot of light. And when Mary saw the angel, the angel said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. And Mary was really scared because she'd never seen anything like this. But the angel told her not to be afraid. And then he asked her if she would be willing to have the baby Jesus. What do you think Mary's thinking in this picture? I think she looks a little bit nervous. I think she looks like maybe she's a little bit scared. But she also looks sort of quiet and peaceful. Now we know what happens next in the story, which is that Mary might have been a little bit nervous, but she said yes. And after that, we know that Mary did have the baby Jesus. So today, I'm so grateful that Mary, even if she was a little bit scared, was brave and said yes to God so that we could have Jesus in the world. Let's say a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for Mary and the fact that she said yes. I love you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Gang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. I'm so grateful for this privilege of delivering God's message today. So we dive into the sacred passage known as the Annunciation, which marks the extraordinary moment when the birth of Jesus was announced to Mary. So today, as we explore Mary's story, we uncover a divine interruption unlike any others in human history. So now hear the word of God from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled in his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendant forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then, the angel left her. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Speak through me 
and always beyond me, so that your word might be heard by your people this day through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Throughout the pages of scripture, we encounter countless instances of God's divine intervention in people's lives, often catching them by surprise. Examples include Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, Joseph, um, or Jesus' disciples, and the Apostle Paul, among others. But I believe no one quite experienced this divine encounter like Mary did. So let us begin by getting to know Mary Forrest. According to today's passage, she was a young maiden, a virgin, and engaged to a man named Joseph. In the Jewish culture of her time, Mary and Joseph were bound by a legally binding engagement, unlike our modern customs. Mary was exceptionally young, as engagement typically occurred around the age of 13 at the time. So we can remind our confirmation class at our church that Mary was their age. And she came from Nazareth, a small town in Galilee, quite far from the religious center near Jerusalem. During the time, hardly anyone paid attention to Nazareth. So in terms of social status, Galilee was seen as the less important area. The folks near Jerusalem were very religious and lived close to the center of religious authority. To the north of them was the disliked Samaria, and beyond, that was the region called Galilee. So it was like the remote countryside for the Jewish people, and Nazareth was not considered important or prestigious in any way. So considering these circumstances, Mary's social status placed her at the bottom rung of society. She was poor. She was a woman, and she was a young. But then, the angel Gabriel came with incredible news for Mary. The angel told her that she would conceive and give birth to a son, and his name would be Jesus, which means God saves. This child had divine destiny. He would be known as the Son of the Most High, and would inherit the throne of David, reigning over the house of Jacob forever, with a kingdom that would never come to the end. In her humility, Mary asked a question, How will this be, since I am a virgin? It is important to take note of her inquiry, because it is not born out of doubt, but rather, a desire to understand the method by which the miraculous event would take place. So here we can see that her willingness to embrace this divine plan stands as a testament to her unwavering faith. So Gabriel's response to it is very profound. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then the angel says some words that God has used at key times in Israel's history, reminding us of essential truth. No word from God will ever fail. So let us go back to Genesis. In Genesis, God told Abraham that Sarah was going to have a baby. He could not believe it. At the time, the Almighty One said, nothing is impossible with God. No word from God will ever fail. In the Exodus, God tells Moses that the people will enjoy bread and meat to eat. But Moses does not see how this is possible. In Numbers chapter 11, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Is it the Lord's power limited? 
Now, you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. No word from God will ever fail. Job, in the midst of all his sufferings, kept his faith and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. No word from God will ever fail. Jeremiah proclaimed, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. No word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. When Mary heard these words, what was her response? Mary nods her head in consent, and she says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Mary's yes was not a muted consent that led her to a joyful pregnancy filled with adoring friends and sweet baby showers. Her life instantly became a series of gossip and drama, and her very decisions to say yes was met with the threat of death. In those times, a woman becoming pregnant before her wedding was assumed to be an adulteress. If a suspected adulteress maintained her innocence, she would be taken to be a public place, and her clothing would be torn and her hair let down, and she would be left there to be mocked and subjected to public humiliation. The cultural expectations was that passerby would mock and humiliate her to make a public example of her. According to Deuteronomy chapter 22, the penalty, if she was found guilty of adultery, could be death uh, by stoning. So Mary's yes to God's calling came with great risk. And moreover, Mary's yes also forced Joseph to make some difficult decisions. Philip Yancey's, one of the Christian authors, says that often a work of God comes with two edges, great joy and great pain. And in that matter of fact response, Mary embraced both. She was the first person to accept Jesus on his own terms, regardless of the personal cost. Mary's response to God's call, embracing both great joy and great pain, which is pinnacle when she said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Mary's declaration, I am your servant, Lord, is not only profoundly beautiful, but also exceptionally courageous. God did not force her. Instead, while thinking about the happy life she had ahead in her coming marriage, she willingly placed her life and future in God's hands. She did not say yes because she fully understood and had all her questions and answers. She said yes in faith and in trust. Now, I want to take some moment to look at the picture on the screen together. This painting, created by Henry Tanner, can help us better understand. Many other artists in their painting showed Mary in fancy and colorful clothes, often making her look like a queen or a noble woman. But in Henry's painting, Mary looks like an ordinary teenage girl from a humble rural background. She has just awakened from a rumble blanket and is sitting on the edge of bed and still half asleep. And also, other artists often depicted the Virgin Mary in their painting, 
showing her reading Bible or praying to emphasize how devoted and holy she was. They wanted to show that to receive God's will, to respond to God's call, one had to display at least this level of devotion and holiness. But in Tanner's painting, Mary is not doing any of those things. She is just plain and she is just ordinary. To this ordinary Mary, Gabriel comes with a bright light, is radiant, but not blinding. God does not approach Mary in a scary or overwhelming way because God already knows her feeling, a mix of fear, faith, anxiety, and obedience. He comes with a warm light and embraces her complicated life in her ordinary, yet complex and anxious life, a life that might be trouble in some ways and maybe even more trouble in the future. God, through his calling, completely understanding and peacefully embraced that. Through that gently powerful peace that surpasses our understanding, God, continues to work out his plan and fulfill one person's life. This ordinariness shown in this picture tells of profound stories that we also could follow God's will for our own lives even as she did. Even if our life does not seem enough in the shadow of the cross, even if it seems just ordinary, we can still join in God's work for His kingdom. That's because we are like just blank canvases, and God Himself is the artist painting on that. God moves through the young and the old, rich and poor, and Jews and Gentiles. No one is left out for God's work. So what truly matters is whether we say yes to God's calling or not. So today, God does not push His plan on us. Instead, God hopes that we will willingly choose to follow His path, living our lives devoted to Him. Now, I want to wrap up this time to share the translate lyrics of one of my favorite Korean gospel songs in English. There is no regret in God's calling, even though you can't see. It is calling that I stand here now. It is calling from God. There is no mistake in God's calling, even though you can't feel. I believe in God who is faithfulness and he's calling out to me. I don't know the plan of God for me who is not enough to serve. I will walk God's road with thankfulness and with humble obedience. By the time when I'm not strong enough, God is always there for me, so I will trust and live in God's plan that is undescribable. The meaning of calling it is much bigger than I thought, and the plan for me, I can't measure it with my own wisdom. I trust God is leading to the best and complete way. I believe in God leading me today. So beloved Riceville, will you pay attention to God who is pay attention to you? Mary trusted God's plan when she said she was God's servant. What will you choose to do? And how will you respond to God's calling? Join in Mary's word. Lord, I am your servant. Amen. Let us pray. 
Holy and loving God, as we reflect on Mary's story, we thank you for the message of hope and grace toward us. We are not perfect and we are not strong, but like Mary, may we have the faith and humility to accept your divine call in our lives. May your Holy Spirit guide us in all that we do. Let your purpose be fulfilled in us, just as it was in Mary. In your holy name, Amen. Beloved Riceville, we are not perfect and we are not strong, yet God wants to use our ordinary life for God's kingdom. So just let us join in God's plan and let us surrender gracefully. And let us join in Mary's word, Lord, I am your servant. May our God of love and peace, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go with you and stay with you today and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>